This video is composed of three lectures given by Rudolf Steiner from the book Temple Legend. Some are only listeners' notes, and there are gaps in the text at some points. The essence and task of Freemasonry from the point of view of spiritual science. Today I wish to make a brief survey of the rites and orders of Freemasonry, as I agreed to do. Of course, I can only impart to you the main essentials, as the whole subject is so comprehensive and so many inessential things are connected with it. The basis for the whole of Freemasonry is to be found in the temple legend concerning Hiram Abif, or Adon Hiram, about whom I have already spoken in connection with the Rosicrucian order. Everything to do with what is called the secret of Freemasonry and its tendency is expressed in this temple legend. We are led to a kind of genesis or theory of evolution of the human race. Let us therefore recall to mind the essentials of this temple legend. One of the Elohim united himself with Eve, and out of this union of a divine creative spirit with Eve, Cain was born. Then another of the Elohim, Jehovah or Adonai, created Adam, who is to be regarded as the primal man of the third root race. This Adam then united himself with Eve, and from this union Abel was born. Thus at the outset of human evolution there are two starting points, Cain, the direct descendant of one of the Elohim with Eve, and Abel, who with the help of the divinely created human being Adam, is the true representative of Jehovah. The whole conception underlying the creation story according to the temple legend, is based upon the fact that there is a kind of enmity between Jehovah and everything that is derived from the other Elohim and their descendants, the, quote, sons of fire, close quote, this being the designation of the descendants of Cain, according to the temple legend. Jehovah creates enmity between Cain and his race and Abel and his race. The outcome of this was that Cain slew Abel. That is the archenemy, which exists between those who receive their existence from the divine worlds and those who work out everything for themselves. The fact that Abel makes the sacrifice of an animal to Jehovah, while Cain brings the fruits of the earth, is an illustration, which the Bible gives too, of this contrast between the race of Cain and the race of Abel. Cain has to wrest from the earth with hard labor the fruits which are necessary for the sustenance of mankind. Abel takes what is already living, what has been prepared for his livelihood. The race of Cain creates, as it were, the living out of the lifeless. Abel takes up what is already alive, what is already imbued with the breath of life. Abel's sacrifice is pleasing to God, but Cain's is not. Thus we find two kinds of human being characterized in Cain and Abel. The one consists of those who accept what God has prepared for them. The others, the free humanity, are those who till the soil and labor to win living products out of what is lifeless. Those who regard themselves as sons of Cain are they who understand the temple legend and wish to live by it. Out of the race of Cain spring all those who are the creators of the arts and sciences of mankind. Tubal Cain, who is the first true architect and the god of smithies and working tools. And also Hiram Abif, or Adon Hiram, who is the hero of the temple legend. This Hiram is sent for by King Solomon, famous for his wisdom, who belongs to the race of Abel, those who receive their wisdom from God. Thus this contrast appears once more at the court of Solomon, Solomon the wise and Hiram the independent worker, who has achieved his wisdom through human striving. Solomon called to his court Balkis, the queen of Sheba, and when she arrived her impression of him was of a statue made of gold and precious stones. It was as though she were looking at a monument bestowed on mankind by the gods, as she gazed in wonderment at the great temple of Solomon, 
Her desire was to meet the architect of this wonderful building, and her wish was fulfilled. Merely through a single glance which the architect cast on her, she was able to appreciate his true worth. Solomon was immediately seized by a kind of jealousy of Hiram. This grew as Balkis demanded that all the workers engaged in the building of the temple should be presented to her. Solomon declared that this was impossible, but Hiram conceded to her wishes. He climbed onto a slight eminence, made the mystical sign of the Tao, and behold, all the workers streamed toward him. The will of the queen had been fulfilled. Because of this, Solomon is disinclined to oppose the enemies of Hiram and to stand out against them. A Syrian stonemason, a Phoenician carpenter, and a Jewish miner were antagonistic toward Hiram. These three fellow craftsmen had been totally denied the Master Word by Hiram Abif. The Master Word is that which would have enabled them to work independently as master builders. The Master Word is a secret that is imparted only to those who have made the grade. Therefore they came to the decision to do Hiram some harm. The opportunity for this came about as Hiram Abif was about to fulfill his masterpiece, the casting of the molten sea. The movement of the waters was to be held fast in form. The surging sea was to be preserved alive, artistically, in a rigid form. That is the point. The three apprentices conspired to make the casting in such a way that instead of flowing into the mold it would flow out over the surroundings. Hiram tried to arrest the flow of the fiery mass by throwing water over it, but this caused the metal to spray up into the air and descend again with great force in a rain of fire. Hiram was powerless to do anything. But suddenly a voice called out to him, Hiram, Hiram, Hiram. He was ordered by the voice to plunge into the sea of fire. This he did, and he sank down ever deeper until he reached the center of the earth where fire has its origin. There he met two figures, his ancestor Tubal Cain and Cain himself. Cain was irradiated with the brightness of Lucifer, the angel of light. Then Tubal Cain gave Hiram his hammer, which had the magical property of restoring all things to their proper order. And he said to him, quote, You will beget a son who will gather about him a race of wise folk, and you will be the progenitor of those who have been born out of fire, which brings wisdom and makes man thoughtful. Close quote. The molten sea was now restored by means of the hammer. Hiram and Queen Balkis then met again outside the city. She became his wife. But Hiram was unable to avert the jealousy of Solomon and the revenge of the three fellow craftsmen. He was slain by them. The only thing he was able to save was the triangle with the master word engraved upon it, which he threw into a deep well. Then Hiram was buried and a branch of acacia was planted on his grave. The acacia branch betrayed the whereabouts of the grave to Solomon, and the triangle was also discovered. It was sealed up and buried in a place known to only a few people, twenty-seven in all. It was agreed that the new master word should be the word first uttered after the finding of the corpse. It is the word which is used by the Freemasons. The Freemasons trace back their origin with some justification to the temple legend and to the old days in which the temple was built by Solomon as a lasting memorial to the secret of the fifth root race. And now we have to learn to understand how mankind can benefit by Freemasonry. That is not so easy. A person who gets to know something of the complicated initiation ceremonies of Freemasonry might be inclined to ask, is what takes place in such ceremonies very trivial and petty? I will now describe to you the initiation ceremony of an apprentice wishing to join the order of craft masonry. Just imagine someone has decided that he wants to become a member of the craft masonry. It consists of three degrees, apprentice, fellow craftsman, 
and Master Mason. After these three degrees come higher degrees which lead the candidate into occult knowledge. I will now describe what happens to a novice about to be initiated into the first degree, that is, the degree of apprentice. When he is brought into the lodge, building for the first time, he is led into a remote chamber by the brother warden and left for some minutes to his own thoughts. Then he is deprived of all metal he has about him, such as gold, silver, and other metals. His clothes are rent at the knee, and the heel of his left shoe is trodden down. In this condition, he is led into the midst of the brethren who are assembled in another room. A cord is passed round his neck, and a sword is pointed at his naked breast. In this state he is confronted by the worshipful master, who asks him if he is still determined to undergo initiation. Then he is cautioned very seriously, and during the further procedures, the meaning of the treading down of the heel and other procedures are explained to him. There are three things which he is obliged to forego. If he is unable to forswear these three things, he will never be accepted as a Freemason. He is told, if you retain the slightest curiosity about anything, then you must leave this house immediately. Secondly, he is told, if you should hesitate to acknowledge every one of your failings and mistakes, then you must leave this house immediately. Thirdly, if you are unable to rise in spirit above all things which differentiate one human being from another, then you must leave this house immediately. These three things are most strictly required from every candidate for initiation. Then a kind of frame is held in front of the candidate through which he is thrown, while at the same time an unpleasant noise is produced so that he flies through the frame with the worst of feelings. In addition to this, they shout to him that he is being thrown into hell. At that same instant, a trap door is closed with a bang and he is given the impression of being in very peculiar surroundings. His skin is then scratched slightly so that blood is made to flow and at the same time a gurgling sound is made by those around him, giving him the impression that he is losing a great deal of blood. After that, three hammer blows are struck by the worshipful master. What is said thereafter in the lodge must be treated in the strictest secrecy. Were the candidate to reveal it, his connection with Freemasonry would be, cha would be changed just as the drink he has offered also changes, sweet from the one side, bitter from the other. This drink is handed to him in an artfully constructed vessel, so that the drink is sweet from one side, but when turned around it changes to bitter, that is, to symbolize how it will be for the candidate if he betrays the secrets. After these proceedings he is led to a flight of stairs in a room which is very dimly lit. This staircase is so constructed that it moves and thereby gives the impression that one has descended a long way, whereas one has really only descended a short distance. It is, the, it is the same when the candidate falls. When he thinks he has fallen into a deep well, he has in reality only fallen a very short way. At this point it is explained to him that he has arrived at a decisive moment. In addition to this he is blindfolded again when he is by the staircase. Then the brother warden is asked, quote, Brother Senior Warden, deem you the candidate worthy of forming part of our society? Close quote. If the answer is yes, he is then further asked, quote, What do you ask for him? Close quote. He is obliged to answer, Light. Then the bandage is removed from the candidate's eyes, and he sees himself in an illuminated chamber. Then follows the basic question, Do you recognize who is your master? He makes answer, Yes, it is he who is wearing a yellow jacket and blue trousers. The blue trousers refer to the rank he possesses. Then he receives the three attributes of apprenticeship, sign, grip, and word. The sign is a symbol of the same kind of occult symbols. Readers aside, there's a gap in the text. End of readers aside. The grip is a special kind of hand clasp to be used when shaking hands. 
These hand clasps are different in the case of an apprentice and in the case of a master. The word changes according to degree. It does not behoove me to reveal what the words are. After that, the person concerned can be admitted to his apprenticeship. On admission, he is asked, How old are you? He makes answer, Not yet seven years. He has to serve seven years as an apprentice before he can progress to become a journeyman. When someone has progressed so far that he is eligible for his master's degree, the initiation ceremony is somewhat more difficult. The main thing is, however, that what is contained in the temple legend is actually carried out in practice on the candidate himself. He who wishes to attain to the master's degree is led into one of the rooms in the lodge building and has to lie in a coffin and to undergo the same fate as the master builder Hiram suffered. Then the new sign, grip, and word are revealed to him. The word is the same as the master word, which was uttered at the finding of Hiram's body. The signs by which a master is known are extremely complicated. Recognition is achieved with the help of many forms and gestures. The Freemasonry masters call themselves, quote, children of the widow, close quote. Thus the company of the masters is directly derived from the Manichaeans. I shall still speak about the connection between Manichaeism and Freemasonry. The task of Freemasonry is connected with that belonging to the whole of the fifth root race. You could, of course, from the point of view of modern rationalist thinking, dismiss all I have told you about the initiation of an apprentice and the various ceremonies connected therewith as mere tomfoolery and play-acting. But that is not what it is. All the things I have mentioned are the outward symbolical enactment of ancient occult practices which once took place on the astral plane through the mystery schools. Such proceedings, therefore, which take place symbolically among Freemasons are carried out on the astral plane in the mystery temples. The initiation into the degree of a master, the lying in the coffin and so on, is actually something which takes place on a higher level. However, in Freemasonry, it only takes place symbolically. One could now ask, where does all this lead? A Freemason should be conscious of the fact that one should act on the physical plane in a way that will maintain a connection with the spiritual worlds. It makes a difference whether one is a member of a community that believes in symbols that help to create a higher community or whether, readers aside, there's a gap in the text, End of readers aside. A Freemason need not necessarily have different thoughts from the man in the street, but his feelings are quite different. Feelings are connected with symbolical enactments, and it is not a matter of indifference whether or no a feeling of this kind is aroused, because it corresponds with a certain rhythm on the astral plane. The meaning behind the first part of the ceremony, the taking away of metal objects, is that the candidate should not retain about his person anything which he has not produced by his own labors. A feeling for this is necessary for anyone who has had his attention drawn to the significance of symbols. He should also retain an enduring memory of the tearing of the trousers at the knee. He should think upon the fact that he ought to present himself in life as if he were appearing completely naked in the eyes of his fellow men. In like manner, the treading down of the heel should act as a constant reminder that even though he may be strong as far as Freemasonry is concerned, he nevertheless is made vulnerable through his heel of Achilles. All subsequent parts of the ceremony have basically a meaning of this kind, particularly in the case of the eerie feeling which is engendered when a cold, sharp-edged sword is laid against his breast. That is a feeling which persists for a long time and becomes focused in a suggestion which returns to his mind at important moments and reminds him that he should develop a kind of cold-blooded attitude. Cold-bloodedness should be the suggestion he receives. Complete responsibility for his own actions is what is symbolized by the cord laid about his neck 
which can be drawn tight at any moment. Presence of mind is suggested by the procedures connected with trap doors, moving stairways, etc. Those are procedures which take place quite differently in the mysteries because they are performed on the astral plane. The candidate must then take the oath. Everything about him is horrible, dark, the room only lit by one or two tiny flames. I want you to consider this oath in its full portent. Quote, I hereby swear that by word, sign, and grip I shall never disclose anything which is henceforth revealed to me within this lodge. Should I betray any of the secrets, I will allow any of the brethren who may get to know about it to slit my throat and wrench out my tongue. Close quote. That is the oath of the apprentice. Still more dreadful is the oath of the journeyman, who consents to have his breast cut open and his heart torn out and thrown to the birds. The oath which the master has to swear is so terrible that it cannot be repeated here. These things are used as a means of evoking a certain kind of rhythm in the sensations of the astral body. The result of this is that the spirit is influenced intuitively. This influencing of the spirit was the main purpose of the Masonic initiation in ancient times. Freemasonry is really very ancient. The Freemasons of old were actually stone masons. They performed all the duties of a mason. They were the builders of temples and public buildings in ancient Greece, where they were known as Dionysiacs. The building work was carried out in the service of the Temple of Dionysus. In Egypt they were the builders of the pyramids, in ancient Rome the builders of cities, and during the Middle Ages they built cathedrals and churches. After the 13th century they also began to build independently of the authority of the church. At this time the expression in quotes Freemason came into use. Before that they were under the authority of the religious communities and were the recognized architects. Let us take our start from the fact that the Freemasons were the builders of the pyramids, of the mystery temples, and of the churches. You will easily gain the conviction, especially by reading Vitruvius, that the manner in which architecture was formerly studied is quite different from our present method. One did not study it at that time by making calculations, but instead definite intuitions were imparted by means of symbols. If you read in t t uh, title Lucifer how the Lemurians developed their building capacity, you will get an inkling of the way in which this art was then practiced. It is not possible today to build in that manner. With amazement and wonder we behold the buildings of the ancient Chinese and of the Babylonians and Assyrians and know that they were constructed without a knowledge of our present-day mathematics. We behold the wonderful engineering feat of Lake Miris in Egypt, a lake which was constructed to collect water which could be diverted into irrigation channels in times of need. It was not built with our modern engineering techniques. The wonderful acoustic effects produced in old buildings were achieved in a way which modern architects are not yet able to imitate. At that time men were able to build by means of intuitive faculties, not through rational understanding. The whole of this kind of architecture stood in relationship to a knowledge of the universe. If you take the Egyptian pyramids, for instance, their measurements correspond to certain measurements in heavenly space, to the distances of the stars in space. The whole configuration of stellar space was depicted in these buildings. There was a connection between the individual building and the dome of heaven. The mysterious rhythm presented to our gaze when we behold the starry heavens, parenthesis, not just with our outer sense, but with an intuitive gaze which penetrates to higher relationships, to rhythmical relationships, close parenthesis, that was what the original architects included in their building, because they were building out of the universe. This art of building was taught in a fashion as different from our own as the teaching of the art of medicine among certain primitive tribes today differs from our own. 
Our teaching today stems from the intellect. In primitive tribes, the doctor is not trained like our doctors, but has certain occult forces developed in him. He has to undergo a bodily training that would be horrible for anybody of a nervous or weak disposition living in our modern culture. This training teaches him indifference to joy and pain, and he who is indifferent to these is already in possession of occult powers. The extent to which the astral body could originally be trained was so great that it led to the development of powers which were designated as the royal art, which is an art derived from the mighty symbols of heavenly proportions. Now you will have an idea of what Freemasonry used to be, and you will realize that it had to outgrow its real task. It was bound to lose its significance as the world became rationalistic. It had its meaning when the fourth cultural epoch was still being developed. The fifth epoch brought about the loss of its importance. Today, Freemasons are no longer Masons. Anybody can become a member. For occultists, symbols have a real meaning. A symbol that is merely a symbol, merely a copy or image, has no meaning. There is only significance in what can become a reality, in what can become a living force. If a symbol acts upon the spirit of humanity in such a way that intuitive forces are set free, then we are dealing with a true symbol. Today Freemasons say they have symbols which mean this or that. An occult symbol, however, is one which takes hold of the will and leads over into the astral body. Inasmuch as our culture has become an intellectual culture, Freemasonry has lost, it, lost its meaning. Regarding connections with Manichaeism, readers aside, there's a gap in the text, end of readers aside. And after that come the high degrees, which extend as far as the 19th, indeed the 96th degree, and start at the 4th degree. The importance of the first three degrees has gradually been transferred to the high degrees. There is a kind of residue still remaining in what is called the Royal Arch, which is still extant in Freemasonry today. About these lighter sides and some of the darker sides of Freemasonry, we shall have to speak again. Part 2 It is important that we should speak about the higher degrees of Freemasonry, because this manner of instruction sets itself special tasks certain aspects of which will be discussed in the near future. We are dealing in the main with a special rite that is called the Combined Rite of Memphis and Mizraim. I have already mentioned that the Memphis and Mizraim Rite possesses a great number of degrees, that 95 degrees must be undertaken, and that usually the supreme leaders of the Grand Orients, that is, those of Germany, Great Britain, and America, possess the 96th degree. These degrees are so arranged that up to the end of about the 80th to 89th degree they are divided up in the way I shall presently describe to you. From about the 87th degree onward start the real occult degrees into which no one can be initiated who has not made a thorough study of the subject. I always make the reservation that in Europe there is nobody who has undertaken all these degrees or who has really undergone an occult Freemasonry training. But that is of no particular concern as far as Freemasonry goes because its renewed task still awaits it in the future. And when the time comes the organization will be available, the vessel will be there which is needed to carry out what has to be achieved. Now I must mention the various branches of Freemasonry and their tendencies, even if I am only to indicate something briefly. First of all, it is to be borne in mind that the whole of the Masonic higher degrees trace back to a personality often spoken about but equally very much misunderstood. He was particularly misunderstood by 19th century historians who have no idea of the difficult situations an occultist can meet in life. This personality is the ill-famed and little understood Cagliostro. The so-called Count Cagliostro 
in whom an individuality was concealed, who was recognized in his true nature only by the highest initiates, attempted originally to bring Freemasonry to London, excuse me, in London, to a higher stage. For during the last third of the eighteenth century, Freemasonry had fairly well reached the state that I have described. He did not succeed in London at that time. He then tried in Russia, and also at The Hague. Everywhere he was unsuccessful for very definite reasons. Then, however, he was successful in Lyon, forming an occult Masonic lodge of the Philalethes, Searchers After Truth, out of a group of local Masons, which was called the Lodge of Triumphing Wisdom. Readers aside, Philalethes, possibly, I'm going to pronounce it that way, it's spelled P-H-I-L-A-L-E-T-H-E-S, Philalethes. End of readers aside. The purpose of this lodge was specified by Cagliostro. What you can read about it is, however, nothing but the work of ignorant people. What can be said about it is only an indication. Cagliostro was concerned with two things. Firstly, with instructions enabling one to produce the so-called philosopher's stone. Secondly, with creating an understanding of the mystic pentagram. I can only give you a hint of the meaning of these two things. They may be treated with a deal of scorn, but they are not to be taken merely symbolically. They are based on real facts. The Philosopher's Stone has a specific purpose, which was stated by Cagliostro. It is meant to prolong human life to a span of 5,527 years. To a free thinker, that appears laughable. In fact, however, it is possible, by means of special training, to prolong life indefinitely by learning to live outside the physical body. Anyone, however, who imagined that no death, in the conventional sense of the word, could strike down an adept, would have quite a false view of the matter. So whoever imagined that an adept could not be hit and killed by a falling roof slate would also be wrong. To be sure, that would usually only occur if the adept allowed it. We are not dealing here with physical death, but with the following. Physical death is only an apparent occurrence for him who has understood the significance of the philosopher's stone for himself and has learned to exteriorize it. For other people it is a real happening, which signifies a great division in their life. For he who understands how to use the philosopher's stone in the way that Cagliostro intended his pupils to do, death is only an apparent occurrence. It does not even constitute a decisive turning point in life. It is in fact something which is only there for the others who can observe the adept and say that he is dying. He himself, however, does not really die. It is much more the case that the person concerned has learned to live without his physical body that he has learned during the course of life to let all those things take place in him gradually that happen suddenly in the physical body at the moment of death. Everything has already taken place in the body of the person concerned, which otherwise takes place at death. Death is then no longer possible, for the said person has long ago learned to live without the physical body. He lays aside the physical body, in the same way that one takes off a raincoat and he puts a new body on just as one puts on a new raincoat. Now, that will give you an inkling. That is one lesson which Cagliostro taught, the philosopher's stone which allows physical death to become a matter of small importance. The second lesson was the knowledge of the pentagram. That is the ability to distinguish the five bodies of man one from another. When someone says physical body, etheric body, astral body, kama, manas body, causal body, bracket, higher manas or spirit self, close bracket, these are mere words, or at best, abstract ideas. Nothing, however, is achieved by that. A person living today as a rule hardly knows the physical body. 
Only one who knows the pentagram learns to know the five bodies. One does not know a body by living in it, but by having it as an object. That is what distinguishes an average person from one who has gone through such a schooling that the five bodies have become objects. The ordinary person does indeed live in these five bodies. However, he lives in them. He cannot step outside of himself and look at them. At best, he can view his physical body when he looks down at his torso or sees it in a mirror. Those pupils of Cagliostro who had followed his methods would thereby have achieved what some Rosicrucians achieved who had basically undergone a training with the same orientation. They were in a school of the great European adepts who taught that the five bodies were realities and not mere concepts. That is called knowing the pentagram and, in quotes, moral rebirth. I will not say that the pupils of Cagliostro never achieved anything. In general, they went as far as comprehending the astral body. Cagliostro was extremely skillful in imparting a view of the astral body. Long before the the catastrophe broke over him. He had succeeded in starting schools in Paris, Belgium, St. Petersburg, and a few other places in Europe, in addition to the one in Lyon, out of which later emerged at least a few people who had the basis for some to proceed to the 18th, 19th, and 20th higher degrees of Freemasonry. Thus Count Cagliostro at least had an important influence on occult masonry in Europe before ending his days in the prison in Rome. The world should not actually pronounce judgment on Cagliostro. As I have already indicated, when people speak about Cagliostro, it is as the Hottentots were to speak about the erection of an overhead railway, because the relationship of apparently immoral, outward acts to world happenings is not understood. I remarked earlier that the French Revolution arose out of the secret societies of the occultists. And if these currents were investigated further, they would lead back to the school of the adepts. It may be that what Mabel Collins depicted in her novel Flitta is hard to understand. In it she describes rather grotesquely how an adept has the world chessboard in front of him in a secret place and lets the pieces play, and how he, so to speak, controls the karma of a continent upon one very simple little board. It does not quite take place as it is described there, but something on a much greater scale than that does actually happen, of which what is described as flitta gives only a distorted picture. Now the French Revolution certainly proceeded from such things as this. There is a well-known story contained in the writings of the Countess Dadamar, who uh, uh, Dadamar. It related that before the outbreak of the French Revolution, the Countess Dadamar, one of the ladies in waiting to Marie Antoinette, received a visit from the Count of Saint Germain. He wanted to be presented to the Queen and to beg audience of the King. Louis the Sixteenth's minister, however, was the enemy of the Count of Saint Germain, who therefore was not allowed into the King's presence. But he described to the Queen with great accuracy and detail the major perils that were looming ahead. Regrettably, however, his warnings were ignored. It was on that occasion that he uttered the great saying, which was based on truth, quote, They who sow the wind shall reap the whirlwind, close quote. And he added that he had uttered this saying millennia previously, and it had been repeated by Christ. Those were words which were unintelligible to the ordinary person. That the Count of St. Germain was right, I will only add a few more touches which are quite correct. In books about the Count of St. Germain, you can read that he died in 1784 at the court of the Langrave of Hessen, who later became one of the most advanced German Freemasons. The Landgrave nursed him until the end. But the Countess Dadamar recounts in her memoirs that he appeared to her long after the year 1784 and that she saw him six more times long after that. In reality, he was at that time in 1790 with some Rosicrucians in Vienna, and said, which is perfectly true, that he was obliged to retire to the Orient 
for the span of 85 years, and that after that time people would again become aware of his activity in Europe. The year 1875 is that of the founding of the Theosophical Society. These things are all connected together in a certain way. In the school founded by the Landgrave of Hessen, also there were two main concerns, the Philosopher's Stone and the knowledge of the pentagram. The Freemasonry founded by the Landgrave of Hessen at that time continued to exist in a rather diluted form. In fact, the whole of Freemasonry, as I have described it, is called the Egyptian Rite, the Rite of Memphis and Misraim. The latter traces its origin back to King Misraim, who came from Assyria, from the Orient, and after the conquest of Egypt was initiated into the Egyptian mysteries. These are indeed the mysteries which originate from ancient Atlantis. An unbroken tradition exists from that time. Modern Freemasonry is only a continuation of what was established then in Egypt. Before I go into details, I would like to say that Freemasonry, which extends to the higher degrees, is something which, in its more intimate aspect, is quite different from the normal craft masonry. The ordinary craft masonry rests on a kind of democratic principle, and if the democratic principle is to be applied to matters of knowledge, it is obvious that it will lead to a state of affairs in which the brothers who have congregated together will mainly do nothing but bring forward their own views. Truth, however, is something about which one cannot hold one's own views. One either knows a truth or one is ignorant of it. No one can say that the three angles of a triangle add up to 725 degrees instead of to 180 degrees. When people sit together and have a discussion, they talk about their own views, sometimes also about the most elevated things. But all of this exists on the level of illusion and is just as irrelevant as what a person says who is ignorant of the true sum of the angles of a triangle and only gives his own opinion about it. Just as one is unable to discuss whether the sum of the angles of a triangle have this or that many degrees, so one is also unable to have a discussion about higher truths. That is why the democratic principle is not applicable to matters of knowledge, for there is no basis of argument on which to discuss them. What distinguishes masonry from the higher degrees, excuse me, what distinguishes masonry of the higher degrees from the craft masonry is that one learns to know the truth step by step. Whoever has recognized a thing can no longer hold more than one opinion about it. One has either recognized it or one has not done so. The 96 degrees have, therefore, a certain justification. At the head is the so-called Sovereign Sanctuary, who is identical with what is known as the Grand Orient in Freemasonry, and is in possession of the real occult knowledge. He knows the path and the speech of that which can be read in the Masonic Manifesto, and, when, and which makes it possible to hear the voice of the wise men of the East. When he has reached this step, he is certainly in a position to hear the voice of the wise masters. So far, however, must one have worked one's way up that one is in possession of very definite knowledge and also of definite inner qualities and inner capacities, which are by no means purely covered by the conventional bourgeois virtues, but are something more meaningful and intimate. I would note that compared with what we have been speaking about here, what theosophical literature reveals of a theoretical or practical nature forms only an elementary part, so that the theoretical side of the higher degrees of Freemasonry far surpasses what can be divulged in popular theosophy. What can be disclosed there is dependent upon the permission given by the adepts who allow these things to be popularized to a certain degree, but it is not possible to make all knowledge public. It is correct to say that humanity will be astonished by some of the discoveries that will be made in the near future but they will be rather premature discoveries and will therefore cause some havoc. The task of the Theosophical Society 
consists mainly in preparing people for such things. For instance, what I described at the beginning as the knowledge of the Philosopher's Stone was formerly much more universally known than it is today, and indeed it was known already during a certain period of the Atlantean epoch. At that time the possibility of conquering death was really something which was commonly known. I only wish to remark that I was not very happy about allowing this truth to appear in print recently. Therefore, where this should have come in the discussion about Atlantean times in the Lucifer article, a row of dots was printed in place of those things which may not yet be communicated. It cannot even yet be communicated in its entirety. There is a very similar piece of information recorded by a very advanced medium, which appeared in the title Theosophical Review, dealing with exactly the same thing in a rather different form. The overcoming of death in Atlantean times is naturally preserved in the memories of the individuals concerned without their being aware of it. There are many people reincarnated today who passed through that period in their former lives and who are led to such revelations through their own memories. That will first of all lead to a kind of overrating of certain medical discoveries. People will imagine that medical science was the discoverer of such things. In reality, people will have been led to them through their own memories of Atlantean times. Certain things will mature in the near future, and therefore we shall speak about them. This makes it necessary to see the need of a step-by-step advance in the gaining of knowledge. This step-by-step advance is therefore rightly emphasized by those who wish to revive the Mizraim and Memphis rite at the present time. Even if this does not succeed during the next year or two, one must not think that failure in such things is of any significance. There is a man at the head of the American Mizraim movement whose significant character constitutes a sure guarantee of constancy in the advance. This is the excellent Freemason John Yarker. It is difficult to say at the moment what form the matter will take in Great Britain and Germany. You will perceive that one must reckon with the human material concerned and that the German movement, therefore, if it is to concern itself with such matters, will also have to reckon with what is available in this direction. If genuine occultists are to take part in such things, they must needs be active in one or other direction. They will not always be able to take part in such things. Even the masters, when they prescribe something of this kind, have to take their cue from great universal laws. If, therefore, you hear something concerning the German Mizraim Memphis tendency, you should not imagine that this now has significance for the future. It is only the frame into which a good picture may later be put. This German Mizraim order stands under the overall guidance of a certain Royce, who holds the actual leadership in Great Britain and Germany today. Then the well-known Karl Kellner also works in this direction. The actual literary work is in the hands of Dr. Franz Hartmann, who serves the Mizraim Rite with his pen to the very utmost. That is, as much as I can impart to you in this or that fragment from here or there concerning this movement. Now I can only characterize what is involved here in general terms. There are four kinds of instruction given in the Mizraim Rite. The 96 degrees can therefore be achieved through four different kinds of instruction or disciplines. These four disciplines, by means of which one advances, are the following. First, the so-called symbolic instruction or discipline. By means of this, certain symbols can be recognized as facts. The person concerned is instructed in the occult laws of nature, through which quite definite effects are produced, through cyclic movements in humanity. The second kind of instruction or discipline is the so-called philosophic one. It is the Egyptian hermetic discipline. It consists of a more theoretical kind of instruction. The third kind of instruction is the so-called mystical discipline, which is based more upon inner development 
and which, if rightly applied, would lead, above all else, to the appropriate manipulation of the philosopher's stone, that is, to the overcoming of death. That is essentially expressed in one of the sentences which I read out to you, which stated that by means of Freemasonry, everyone is able to convince himself of the fact of immortality. It depends, however, as the Kabbalah says, whether this is requested or not. The fourth kind of instruction is the Kabbalistic one. It consists in the recognition of the principles of world harmony in their truth and reality. The ten basic readers aside, there's a gap in the text, end of readers aside. By means of each of the four paths, one can rise to a higher perception through the Mizraim rite. But there is actually no one within the ranks of Freemasonry today who would accept the responsibility of giving practical guidance to anyone, because those concerned have not undergone these things themselves and the whole affair is a provisional arrangement and only intended to provide a framework for something which is still to come. It is possible that this framework will be filled with occult knowledge. Occult knowledge has to be cast in existing molds. The important thing is that such molds exist in the world. If there is molten metal and no mold into which to pour it, you are unable to do anything but let it run out in one lump. So it is also with spiritual currents. It is important that molds exist into which can be poured the spiritual metal that is symbolized by the molten sea. That will become recognized when what is now seemingly only vegetating receives form for outward manifestation. Last time I read to you from a speech by the English Prime Minister Balfour. From that then, it is already noticeable that certain things are physical truths today that are in primeval occult perceptions. If you read Blavatsky's title, The Secret Doctrine, you will find there a passage relating to electricity, which expresses, word for word, what physicists are now gradually arriving at. What is written there is, however, only a hint at what is actually involved. It is the physical atom that is in question. This was misunderstood by all outward but not occult science until four or five years ago. It was taken to be a body having mass in space. Nowadays one is beginning to recognize that this physical atom bears the same relationship to the force of electricity that a lump of ice bears to the water from which it has been frozen. If you conceive of water becoming frozen to ice, so is the ice also water, and in like manner the atom of physics is nothing else but frozen electricity. If you can grasp this point completely and were to go through the statements about the atom contained in all the scientific journals until a year or two ago, and were to regard them as rubbish, you will have more or less the right idea. It is only very recently that science has been able to form a conception of what the atom is. It stands in the same relationship to electricity as ice does to the water out of which it has been frozen. The physical atom is condensed electricity. I regard Balfour's speech as something of extreme importance. It is, readers aside, there's a gap in the text, end of readers aside, something which has been published since 1875, in brackets 1879, possibly, question mark. The fact has been known to occultists for millennia. Now, one is beginning to realize that the physical atom is condensed electricity. But there is still a second thing to be considered, what electricity itself is. That is still unknown. They are ignorant of one thing, namely where the real nature of electricity must be sought. This nature of electricity cannot be discovered by means of any outer experiments or through outer observation. The secret which will be discovered is that electricity, which one learns to, when one learns to view it from a particular level, is exactly the same as what human thought is. Human thought is the same thing as electricity, viewed one time from the inside, another time from the outside. 
Whoever is now aware of what electricity is knows that there is something living within him which in a frozen state forms the atom. Here is the bridge from human thought to the atom. One will learn to know the building stones of the physical world. They are tiny condensed monads, condensed electricity. In that moment when human beings realize this elementary occult truth about thought, electricity, and the atom, in that same moment they will have understood something that is of the utmost importance for the future and for the whole of the sixth post-Atlantean epoch. They will have learned how to build with atoms through the power of thinking. This will be the spiritual current which will again have to be cast in the molds that have been prepared for it by occultists over millennia. But because the human race had to pass through the era of the development of understanding and to look away from the true inner work, the molds have become mere shells. But they still retain their function as molds and the right kind of knowledge will have to be poured into them. The occult investigator obtains his truth from the one side, the physical scientist from the other. Just as Freemasonry has developed out of working masonry, out of the building of cathedrals and temples, so one will in future learn to build with the smallest of building blocks, with entities of condensed electricity that will call for a new kind of masonry. Then industry will not be able to carry on any more as it does today. It will become so chaotic and will only be able to work purely out of the struggle for existence per se, as long as man does not know. Readers aside, there's a gap in the text. End of readers aside. Footnote, there is a gap here in the shorthand report. However, a completion of the sentence is to be found in legible writing. Bracket, what has to be poured into these husks in the way of thought. End of footnote then it would be possible for someone in Berlin to drive into the city in a cab while in Moscow a disaster which had, he had caused was taking place and nobody at all would have any inkling that he had been the cause of it. Wireless telegraphy is the beginning of this. What I have portrayed is in the future. There are only two possibilities available. Either things go on chaotically as industry and technology have done until now in which case it will lead to whoever has the possession of these things being able to cause havoc, or else it will be cast in the moral mold of Freemasonry. Footnote. This last sentence appears as follows in the notes of Marie Steiner von Sievers. Quote, these things will either continue chaotically, as industry and technology have done until now, or harmoniously, as is the aim of Freemasonry. Then the highest development will be achieved. End of footnote. There's a question. Why is the Catholic Church so antagonistic toward Freemasonry? Answer from Steiner. The Catholic Church does not want what is coming in the future. Pius IX was initiated into Freemasonry. He tried, through the chapter of Clermont, to bring about a connection between the Jesuits and the Freemasons. That did not succeed. And therefore the old enmity between these two remained. Our Jesuits know little about these things and the clergy are also unaware of what is involved. The actual clergy, readers aside, there's actually a large gap in the text here, and the readers aside. The Trappists have to keep silent, for it is known that by doing so, an important faculty of inspired speech in the next life is implanted. That is indeed only to be understood through a knowledge of reincarnation. Part 3 Last time I spoke about Freemasonry, and today I wish to add something to that. I should like you to consider that I am in a different position with regard to Freemasonry than to the other subjects we have spoken about, or which we still intend to discuss, as I usually only speak about things of which I have personal experience. In the present instance I should stress to you that I am speaking to you as a non-Mason, and only from a theosophical point of view, whereas to do full justice to the subject of what Freemasonry really is, it should be treated by one who is himself a Freemason. He would not do this, but this is for other reasons which it is best not to discuss. At the same time, I would request that you treat what I have to say with reserve. 
When I said to you that only a Freemason himself could speak about what it really represents in its innermost core, so I would beg you to take into account that, in spite of that, there is probably no such Freemason in existence in the whole of Europe. This may strike you as odd, but it is so. Since the 18th century, Freemasonry has been in a very peculiar state, excuse me, stage of its development. And I would ask you to regard everything I told you about it last time as being applicable to what it probably would have been like if it had remained as it was in the 16th or 17th centuries. As this is not the case, Freemasonry is, so to speak, only a kind of husk devoid of its true content. It can be compared to a petrified plant which is no longer the same as what constituted the plant but is a crust or shell made up by something else. The ordinary craft masonry does not come into consideration where the things we are going to discuss are concerned. For this craft masonry with its three degrees of apprentice, journeyman and master took its start from the Charter of Köln in 1535. Today it is not really anything more than a union for mutual stimulation with regard to higher education and schooling, a union for the purpose of mutual support and stimulation among its members. It is true that these first three degrees are, as it were, only the last remaining vestiges of the original three degrees of Freemasonry. And if the ceremonies were to take place as in former times, which they do not, then apprentice, journeyman, and master would be initiated in the way I described last time. The regulations are certainly that they should take place in this way, but only a few people know that these regulations exist, and still fewer know the meaning of these things. Everything I have told you about the effect of these ceremonies on the astral plane is something of which craft masonry has no clear understanding. Now, both the British and also the St. John Lodges in Germany possess these three degrees which I have named, and they are actually all in the same state as I have just described. But the possibility is there within these three degrees through the very fact that the symbols exist of penetrating through them to the deeper wisdom which underlies them. A proof of this is provided by the fact that a Mason whom you all know well by name has addressed his brother Masons in such a way that the germ of his theosophical awareness is thereby revealed, that he was able in a certain sense to speak in theosophical terms to an audience of Masons. The Freemason of whom I speak is Goethe. As theosophists you will immediately find something very familiar when I read to you two verses of his Freemasonry poem, which he intended for his brethren of the Lodge. Quote, Yet call from beyond the voices of spirits, the voices of masters. Omit not to practice the powers of the good. Crowns here are woven in quiet, eternal, rewarding with plenty those who are active. We beg you, have hope. Close quote. Goethe speaks here of the masters, and he speaks of them within the precincts of the lodge, in spite of the fact that he knows that those sitting around him have no inkling of the profundity of his words, because he is also aware of the fact that through the atmosphere which surrounds a Freemasonry lodge, through the presence of symbols, vibrations are set in motion which influence the astral body and thereby bring about a certain result. That is something which scarcely enters into the consciousness of Freemasons, but upon which those who know can still build today. Those who are led beyond the first three degrees to the higher degrees possess rather more consciousness. The first of these higher degrees is the royal arch degree, the degree of royal art. This degree is distinguished by the fact that its chapter or union has a special organization, which is filled with deeper meaning. In their gatherings, especially in those in which a new member is to be initiated into the secrets, never more than twelve fellow members are allowed to be present, so that, after the manner of occult brotherhoods, 
they really represent something other than than themselves, something which lives among them in a mysterious fashion. They are not regarded just as persons, but as the personification of particular qualities. The first who represents the most important in the circle of twelve is called Zerubbabel. He is a leader, the sun, S-U-N, from whom radiates the light which is to illuminate the others. He must needs be the cleverest and has to have a certain knowledge of the essence and meaning of the secret sciences. That is seldom the case with present fashions in the royal arch degree. I am talking about an ideal situation in fact, which only very rarely arises, when suitable people happen to be present. The next officer is Jeshua, the high priest, the third, Haggai, the prophet. Together with Zerubbabel, these three compose the Grand Council. The first and second principles come next, then the two scribes, Ezra and Nehemiah, and the janitor, or Tyler, without the door. After that come the so-called lesser companions. Not more than twelve people may be present at any time. These twelve represent the twelve signs of the zodiac. The whole is a portrayal of the sun's passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac. That reminds us of what I told you about the Masons having taken their start in reproducing astronomical laws in particular buildings, in churches, cathedrals, etc., The arrangement of the lodge, though this is not always the case, is a large square hall with a vaulted ceiling, painted blue and covered with golden stars to represent the heavens. The positions taken up by the participants is closely prescribed by ceremony. The novices, who are last to enter, take their places in the north, as they are not yet able to endure warmth. In the east stands Zerubbabel, In the west is the high priest Jeshua and the prophet Haggai. Readers aside, I'm pronouncing H-A-G-G-A-I as Haggai. I apologize if that's wrong. And the readers aside. And those who take their places in the south are roped together. Each of them has the rope wound around him three times, uniting him with his fellows at a distance of three or four decimeters. He who is initiated into this fourth degree, the first of the higher degrees, which in certain regions still provides an inkling of the significance of the temple legend, has to pass three veils. At each passing of a veil, one of the secrets is imparted to him. He is told the secret meaning of a particular verse from the Pentateuch. After this, the secret of the Tau sign is explained, and the Holy Word the master word, is given him, which is the word by which masons of the fourth degree recognize one another. And then before all else, it is made clear to him in his first instruction how ancient Freemasonry is. The craft masons do not usually get to know that, or if they do hear it, they have not the slightest understanding of these matters. The history of Freemasonry is related to them in the following way. The first true mason was Adam, the first man, who had an extraordinary knowledge of geometry at the time of his expulsion from paradise. He was recognized as the first mason, because being the first man he he was a direct descendant of the light. The true deeper origin of Freemasonry, however, predates humanity entirely. It resides in light itself which existed before mankind. That is most profound and reveals for those who can understand it what theosophical wisdom has again made public through its description of the formation of the earth through the first two root races and into the third, the time of Lemuria. Whoever can apprehend this through Freemasonry has received into himself something of tremendous importance but that takes place in only the rarest cases because Freemasonry is, as it were, degenerate today. This has come about because since the 16th century man has had little understanding of the true meaning of Freemasonry, namely, that a temple has to be built in such a way that its proportions 
are a reflection of the great cosmic proportions. That a cathedral has to be built in such a way that its acoustics reproduce something of the harmony of the spheres, which is the source of all acoustics in the outer world. A knowledge of this original insight was gradually lost. Thus it came about that when des Augulaires, uh, uh, readers aside, apologize for the pronunciation, D-E-S-A-G-U-L-I-E-R-S, des Augulaires, and the readers aside, reunited Freemasonry in England during the first half of the 18th century, no one had any proper understanding of the fact that the word Freemasonry had to be taken literally, that it really did concern the work of the practicing Mason, and that the Mason was one who built churches and temples and other great buildings according to cosmic laws and incorporated into them heavenly and not earthly proportions. This original insight and its reflection in Freemasonry was lost. There was no longer any conscious appreciation of the transformation wrought by a proper use of acoustics in a building where the speaker's words are thrown back and are thereby changed in their effect. Those who built the great cathedrals of medieval times were the great Freemasons. They were aware of the importance of the fact that what was spoken by the priest should be reflected back from the individual walls and the whole congregation immersed in a sea of sound breathing and fluctuating in significant vibration, which would exercise still greater effect on the astral body than on the physical ear. That has all been lost, and it was inevitable that this should be so in the New Age. That is what I meant when I told you that what is left of Freemasonry is only the husk of what it was in former times. Apart from these three degrees, there are also the higher degrees, and those are possessed in a fairly complete form by the larger communities of Great Britain, America, Italy, Egypt, and also by Eastern Freemasonry, especially that known as Oriental or Memphis Masonry. In Germany, where there is a branch of the Memphis Mizraim Freemasonry with worldwide Masonic connections, the higher degrees are also functioning. But in Germany, within the St. John Freemasonry, there is so little understanding of the real significance of the higher degrees that the St. John Masons there generally look upon the higher degrees as nonsense. The Grand Orient of Germany is obliged, for this reason, merely to let the St. John Masons in general pass properly as Masons. In this respect, there are great differences between the masonry practiced in Germany and that of England or Great Britain. In British masonry, a kind of reconciliation has been achieved through the Articles of Union of 1813 between craft masonry, with its three degrees, and those branches of masonry that recognize the higher degrees. Thus, as an apprentice in craft masonry, one is allowed to enter and also graduate into the fourth, fifth, and sixth degrees, that is, into the higher degrees. The degrees pertaining to craft masonry are credited to one in England. That is not the case in Germany. The German Grand Orient of the Memphis and Mizraim order undertakes the working of the three lowest degrees itself. The Orient Freemason must therefore have passed the first three degrees at the outset. He must furthermore commit himself to rising at least to the eighteenth degree. He may not rest until he has done so. A German mason of the St. John's order is therefore never admitted to the higher degrees of Orient masonry without having attained the three lesser degrees. The Orient masonry consists of a graded instruction in occultism. As I said last time, it gives a picture of the teaching given in the higher degrees those which succeed the royal arch degree. These provide a kind of astral training which leads up to the 18th or 20th degrees. Then comes that which provides a kind of mental training, a training which leads to a kind of life on the mental plane and advances to the 60th or 70th degree. 
Lastly comes the highest training of all, the most profound occult instruction, which can be undertaken in the Grand Orient up to the 96th degree. There are only very few in Germany who have advanced to the 96th degree, but in spite of everything, there is something in all this which will presently prove to you how little is left in present-day masonry of what it formerly encompassed. The most interesting point is that those who have progressed to the 96th degree have not always been through a Masonic training, and that there is scarcely anyone at all who has completed the whole gamut of the training. There are indeed a few who have higher degrees. They have been invested with the 3rd or the 33rd or the 96th degree, but those who possess these distinctions have not gained them through Masonic training, but through their but through other occult institutions, and they have allowed their knowledge to be used to bring about the redemption of Freemasonry. If someone has attained to the 96th degree, it has not been achieved through Masonic training. Bluntly, it is considered that in this respect Freemasonry is indebted to the occult training of other schools. In this sense, we have to interpret the manifesto which has been given by the Grand Orient of the Memphis and Mizraim Rite as a kind of ideal document. I will read it to you with one or two explanations. What is given here must not be construed as though it could be put into practice in the present day. It must be pointed out today that no Freemason, not even one who has the 96th degree, would take responsibility for taking another Freemason through these prescriptions since he himself has not undergone them. Quote, Concerning the secrets of the higher occult degrees of our order, a manifesto of the Grand Orient. One of the secrets belonging to the highest degree of our order consists in providing the appropriately conditioned brother with the practical means of erecting the true temple of Solomon within man, of restoring the lost word. That is, our order provides the initiated and selected brother with practical means enabling him to gain proof of pure immortality during his present earthly life. Close quote. That is one of the points that are of utmost importance. The next point is one that exists in all centers of occult training. No calling up of spirits or spiritualistic activities. Anyone who practices spiritualism is strictly excluded. Quote, this secret is one of the true Masonic secrets and rests solely in the possession of the higher occult degrees of our order. It has been handed down by word of mouth in our order from the ancestors of all true Freemasons, the wise men of the East, and will only be transmitted by us in like manner. Close quote. Steiner again. That is the practice in occult societies. Quote, Naturally, however, the success of this practical instruction for the attainment of this secret again depends entirely on the candidate himself. For of what use are the best and most tested and detailed instructions given to a candidate wishing to learn to swim if he is not himself prepared to move hands and feet when he comes into contact with the water? Or of what use is the most comprehensive guidance in learning to paint? or the exposition of the most vivid colors by way of example if the candidate to whom painting is being taught will not take the paintbrush into his own hand and seek to mix the colors himself. He will never become an artist unless he does so. Those brothers, the discoverers of this secret, guarded it as a rare, self-acquired possession, and in order not to be misjudged or even derided by the man in the street, they concealed it by means of symbols, as we do to this day. Close quote. These symbols are no longer decipherable for the Freemason of the present day. Such symbols are not arbitrarily chosen. These are not things by means of which someone can portray something, like a professor who says, I will illustrate this graphically. These symbols have been taken from the objects themselves, which have been engraved by nature. He who recognizes them for what they are, who can really read what they contain, 
comes into contact with their innermost being. He is led by them into their inner nature. These symbols portray the thing itself and do not have a merely symbolical meaning. Within Freemasonry there is no one who is able to give guidance that would enable a person to arrive at the object itself. Quote, These symbols are, however, no arbitrary chosen pictures, and they do not rest upon any chance occurrence, but are founded on the attributes of God and of man, and must be regarded as archetypal. But we will never take the form, the vessel, the ritual, the symbols for their content, but will seek the spiritual content within the form. Close quote. These words show, readers aside, there's a gap in the text, end of readers aside, for the symbol itself portrays the object. Quote, and when we have found this, the spiritual content, and have absorbed it into ourselves, we shall recognize through this spiritual content the absolute necessity of the form, the ritual, the symbolism. Our higher degrees themselves provide the brother with certain proof of the immortality of man. Close quote. Steiner again. This they would do if they were, if they were worked. Quote again. That is and has been the great longing of mankind ever since human beings could reason, who could reason existed. Mankind needs to have this assurance of a life after death in order to be truly happy in this present life. Therefore, all the mysteries contained in the religions and centers of hidden wisdom have occupied themselves with this question as their highest and principal task. The Church has naturally also occupied itself with this question of the lost word, the lost immortality. But it directs the candidate along the path of grace and portrays it as a gift from above and not as something to be achieved by personal effort. Our order, however, places it within the power of each individual seeker by practical means to unite himself consciously and voluntarily with the world consciousness, with the ultimate forces of creation. Close quote. That means, therefore, to provide insight into and union with that world which otherwise is only accessible through the portal of death. From all this you may draw the conclusion that what belongs to the world's profundities was once found in Freemasonry, but is no longer there in the empty husk which it presents today. You must ask yourselves why. Now the meaning of the temple legend, the meaning of operative masonry, like all intuitive knowledge, had to be lost to humanity because the fifth cultural epoch is actually the epoch of understanding. Intuition had for a time to lie dormant in the world and Freemasonry is intuitive in its whole attitude and manner. I would like to draw your attention to Vitruvius and to the true symbolical building instructions that he gave. Only those, however, who have the right intuition for it can follow these instructions. Today these symbolical instructions have been replaced by intellectual, rational ones. Reason had to become the keynote of man's development for a while, because everything that has meanwhile come to us through great conquests of nature must be incorporated in the whole organism of human activity. Understand what it means. The whole of the mineral kingdom will be included in the progress of the world during the present round of evolution. It will be included in such a way that man will gradually transform the whole of nature through his own spirituality. That is the meaning of the molten sea, that the whole of mineral nature will effectively be transformed. Man works in industry so as to weave organization, his own spirituality in brackets, there's a question about, readers aside about the continuity here, and of readers aside, into mineral nature. If you consider a machine, and readers aside, there's a gap in the text again, and the readers aside. In this way, man thus works the whole mineral kingdom back and forth with his own spirit. This recasting of nature, this recasting of what is mineral, will be perfected when our present round of evolution has come to an end. 
The whole of mineral nature will then have been changed. Man will have put his stamp on it, just as he imprints his stamp on a quantity of metal when, for example, he fashions a watch. Thus, when a new round of evolution begins, the mineral kingdom can be sucked in, absorbed. In order completely to finish the development in this sphere, the whole way of thinking that has gripped man since the 16th century must be carried right into the atom. Thus only when reasoned thinking can grasp the atom can Freemasonry again revive. In the first stage, the outer form will be grasped. The next step will be when man has learned to think right into the mineral atom. When he has an understanding of how to make use of what lives in the atom and place it in the service of the whole. It is true that only now and perhaps only during the last five years human thinking has turned to tracing natural forces as far as the atom. And indeed he who would understand this precisely must follow the latest phase of the various developments in electricity. The speech which the English Prime Minister Balfour has made on the subject of our contemporary world, Outlook, is interesting in this connection albeit only in its outward implications. What he said there about new electrical theory is something of enormous importance. He hints at the critical turning point in the development of man's thinking. He is, to a certain extent, conscious of this and mentions it in one part of his speech. Thus we see how something is dawning in the consciousness of natural science which plays into the future. This has been known to occultists since 1879. I emphasize this, although I cannot prove it. The occultist knows that this will come about, a new point of departure from the atom into the mineral physical world. That will be what will enter into the world in the sixth cultural epoch, and through this Freemasonry will also be regenerated. In Freemasonry the occultist has something very remarkable, something unprecedented, for it, it has something primeval in its foundation. It belongs to the most ancient of traditions, which has preserved almost a hundred degrees in a precisely specialized structure, in spite of the fact that it has lost nearly all of its content, and that none of those belonging to it in Europe are able to form an adequate conception of it. But still, the thing is there, and one will only need to fill the outer, the whole outer husk with new content. The thing is there, waiting to be brought to life again. Now there's a, uh, some points from the subsequent discussion. Steiner, rights of Memphis, Oriental, Oriental rights and Grand Orient rights. A conference of occultists discussed whether the occult doctrine could be made public or not. From that it became clear that there are two tendencies, a left and a right tendency one which is free-thinking, and one which is conservative. End of the reading of the essence and task of Freemasonry from the point of view of spiritual science by Rudolf Steiner given in Berlin in December of 1904.